Hello and welcome to the ProMax webinar on air separation. For those who don't know me, my name is Václav Miklas. If, if I'm not teaching webinars, I am in our European BRNE office in Brno, Czech Republic, or I'm on the road helping our European customers. I am specifically responsible for taking care of customers in Southern and Central Europe. As far as I know, this is the first ever air separ separation webinar in the history of brain research and engineering. So you are kind of witnesses of history in the making. And I, I wouldn't call myself an expert in this area, but I definitely find this topic interesting. And I really hope that the say sharing of knowledge is going to be a two way road. So I'm going to show you some interesting aspects of modeling these kind of units in Promax. And I also hope and look forward to learning some practical aspects from you all. So let's take a look at what's ahead of us today. Here you can see the agenda. So we'll start with a bit of theory with some background. Uh, we'll look into some of the most common technologies for air separation. And in the second part, we'll focus on something we'll do a Promax demonstration on. So that's cryogenic air separation process. And basically the main principles to kind of wrap our heads around this method. In the most important part, so part C and D, I'm going to switch to Promax and then it's, it will start to be really interesting because we will be looking at how to model these units in Promax step by step. And uh, in, the, in the last section, I'm also going to show you some advanced tools that we have in Promax and that you can apply on the model. So the first and an important question is how do we separate air? And what is actually air, right? Most of the engineers probably know these rough numbers that we have around 78% of nitrogen, 21% of oxygen, and 1% of argon in air, in dry air. Besides of that, we also have a bit of CO2, noble gases such as neon, helium, and krypton from the times when Superman was around in, in air. And also there's, there's a bit of methane. Uh, CO2 is, say, the largest out of all these small ones. We have around 400 ppm of CO2 in air and growing. But the composition is not really as important as what's going on in terms of structure of these molecules and how it's important to us. So we can see that both nitrogen and oxygen are diatomic molecules. Argon as noble gas is just monoatomic. But the nitrogen and oxygen, they are not really the same because for nitrogen, we can see that there's a triple bond while for oxygens, the, there's, uh, there's double bond. And that of course is going to affect the size of the molecule and also behavior. So that's something that we can use as an advantage when it comes to separation. This brings us to the next slide where we can see some of the separation mechanisms. One of them can be molecule size. So even though oxygen is a heavier component, because of what we saw on the last slide, oxygen molecules are actually smaller than the nitrogen ones by around 2 to 3%. So that's something that you can use when the molecules have to pass through something like membrane. Another mechanism can be some sort of electrochemistry. The oxygen and nitrogen molecule, they are uh, different in terms of the, the possibility to polarize them. And that's something that we can use again. And the same applies for ionization uh, because for some active transport membranes, we first need to ionize the molecules and uh, that can be used. And the last bullet point we have here, different boiling points. So that's something that we like as chemical engineers. When you have different boiling points, you can use rectification to separate the components from each other. And the, the mechanisms we saw, they kind of correlate with the technologies. So first that I have here is adsorption. 
This is followed by membranes and cryogenic processing. And I also have a table here, which roughly compares uh, these three in terms of economic range, in terms of the capability to produce byproducts, and also in terms of purity limits. As you can see, absorption and membranes, they, they have some upper limit. Until this point, they are economic. The reason why they are not typically feasible for large scale plants is that the, the capital cost of these technologies is basically, basically a linear function of capacity. And so you don't really have any decrease of cost per unit capacity. And for, for, from this perspective, uh, um, it's, it's really only economic until some point. For cryogenic processing, on the other hand, there is some decrease of unit cost per, per capacity. And there's a reason why the, the largest uh, plants are, are the cryogenic ones. If we take a look at, at, at byproduct capability, the, the cryogenic processing allow us to produce uh, basically almost pure oxygen, almost pure nitrogen, almost pure argon which is something we typically cannot do for the other two technologies. And this also is, is kind of in line with what we can see for purity limits because cryogenic processing typically yields the, the highest purities while absorption tops around 95% and for membranes, it is typically around 60 for some active transport membranes, it can be higher, but typically in this kind of range. We have a quick question here. Purity limit here is related to oxygen. Is that right? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. I should have mentioned it here. Thanks for that. So for adsorption, the, the most popular adsorbents are zeolites and carbon. As you can see, they are, uh, they are selective towards different component. For zeolites in the void spaces, uh, there are some elect electric fields that exist. And when I was talking about how nitrogen and oxygen are, are different in terms of how polar, pol polarizable they are, nitrogen is more polar, polarizable, so it is more likely to be trapped in this adsorbent than oxygen, which makes it the zeolites are selective for nitrogen. For carbon, on the other hand, uh, the, the principle of the adsorption is really based on the fusion into the pores in the absorbent. And that's the reason why the smaller molecules, so the oxygen molecules, are going to be trapped instead of nitrogen. One bullet point we have here is that typically we, we regenerate absorption beds by means of pressure or, or pressure change. So we are reducing pressure even down to vacuum. And by that, we are basically decreasing the absorption capacity, releasing whatever is absorbed in the bed. This approach is faster and also simpler in terms of operation if you compare it to TSA, the temperature swing absorption. And purity is something I've already mentioned, can be around 95%. Uh, the remainder is typically argon. So uh, you, you would end up with 95% oxygen and 5% of argon. Membranes, when it comes to membranes, we typically mean the polymeric membranes, but there are also ceramic membranes, for instance, which can also be used. Polymeric are the most common. And again, we're using the fact that oxygen molecules are smaller and that, can, that they can permeate to the low pressure side while on the rentonate part, we have some waste, which is nitrogen and the other components. This way, we typically end up with what we call an oxygen enriched air. So the purity is not really high, but uh, as you can see, it can be, it, or it used to be less than 50%, but membranes, that's a field that is still developing. So it's getting better. And as I've already mentioned, uh, for ceramic membranes, they, uh, they might be operated at a high temperature. We refer to these as ion transport membranes. And what can happen is that, is that oxygen can ionize and then 
by some sort of potential, for instance, electric voltage, we are able to basically force the ions from one side to the other. And this can basically, or this is the way to achieve higher purities. As you can see here, we do have a membrane block in Promax. We are not going to discuss membranes during this webinar. All right, as I said, what we are going to discuss in Promax today is cryogenic separation. And that's the reason why we are going to spend a bit more time on this, even in terms of the theoretical background. The first question is, why so cryogenic? So why do we need to go to such low temperatures? Of course, air in normal conditions is gas. And to get it to, to, get it to boiling point, to get it to two-phase region, we, of course, need to cool it down quite a bit. As you can see, all the components, they have boiling points below uh, 100 degrees Celsius. The three that are present at highest concentrations, so oxygen, argon, and nitrogen, they are closer to minus 200. And as you can see, the other kind of problematic thing here is that their boiling points are actually really close to each other. So we know as chemical engineers, if, if you have close boiling points, that means that the, the relative, or basically the K, K values are really small, so it's it's hard to separate these from each other. And that means that in terms of number or theoretical stages, we we really need large columns, which is one of the reasons why I find these units really fascinating. They are one huge units for sure. All right, so now we we kind of discussed or touched on this this boiling points area. And we can take a look at the typical configuration of a cryogenic processing or air separation. So the, the units, there's a, there's a lot of flexibility and the, the, configuration they can, the configurations, they can vary. But these four steps are, are present in 90% cases. So in first step, you are going to compress air and also basically remove anything that can make the, the rectification impossible. So as first step, you might have a mechanical filter to remove any, any uh, particular matter. And in the second step, you are compressing air. The reason is that the whole idea for this cryogenic processing is sacrificing pressure in order to reach really low temperatures. So that's why we need to increase pressure in this first step. High pressure also helps in molecular seed where we are removing water and CO2. The reason why we need to remove them is that they are very likely to be present in solid form at these low temperatures. And we definitely don't want to have any sort of freeze out in the unit. So we have to make the, the, the stream, the feed stream, basically water free and CO2 free. In the second step, we have what we call cold production. If we want it to be precise, this is not really cold production. It is, the, the, as I said, the, the cold is produced by dropping the pressure. But we definitely want to use this cold to preserve this cold in the process by some sort of heat integration. So that's why we are cooling down the air while heating up the product. So we want to really recover as much cold as we can from the product. The exchangers that are used for this type of applications are plate fin heat exchangers, which allows us to, to get really small temperature approaches uh, and they, in terms of material, steel would probably be very good for this, this, these low temperatures because it would become brittle. So aluminum, for instance, is used more often. And the goal here in the second part is to get temperature of air close to liquefaction temperature. So, you know, from, I don't know, 30 to 40 degrees Celsius, which is something you might have after the first part, you need to cool it to minus 60-ish. Uh, minus 160 or something like that. So 
it, it really does a lot of heat integration for us, this second part. The third part is the crucial one. So we want to separate this air to the product. And the, the most typical configuration is one really tall column. However, this one column uh, consists of two sections and there's no direct material exchange between these sections. They are, each of them is, is operated at different pressures. So they, they, in terms of modeling, they definitely, they, they basically act as two separate columns in the lower section. We have high pressure and the intermediate product out of this is oxygen enriched air. So we have something between 35 and 40% of oxygen in this intermediate product. And the other intermediate product is almost pure nitrogen. In the upper section, this is where we do the trick. This is where we finish the separation. It is operated at lower pressure. And from this upper section, we want to get uh, our final products with purities over 99%. This is something, this is a place where you could theoretically stop if you, you know, uh, were happy with having argon in, in either your nitrogen product or your oxygen product. But in most of the cases, that's, uh, that's not what's happening. And that's why we have the fourth step, which is argon separation. And this is the place where you are, first of all, are able to get uh, relatively pure argon. And also, it also helps uh, the, with the purity of your oxygen and nitrogen streams. We, of course, need a separate column for this, sometimes even two columns. And as I said, this allows you to basically get pure or relatively pure argon. In the next slide, you can see an example of layout. So what it could look like. As I said, there's a lot of different configurations. So uh, there is not really one general uh, layout, but this is something we will be today putting into Promax together during this webinar. So let's take a look at where exactly do we have these four steps we saw in the last slide. The, the first step is the, the compression I mentioned together with purification. We, in this case, are going to simplify it a bit. Uh, so we are going to assume that this air feed is already without water and CO2. However, you could theoretically put MOLSEF or an imitation of MOLSEF into Promax with a divider block and, and remove these two after the compression as it's done also in, in reality in many cases. As you can see, the compression is done in, in multiple steps. The reason is simple. The target pressure is typically somewhere between six and 10 bar. Uh, so doing this from you know, atmospheric pressure in one step would be impossible. And also we are able with this intermediate intercooling, we are able to get closer to isothermal uh, compression, which is in terms of the overall shaft work is more efficient. So this is the first step. The second step is cold production. As you can see, we have two multi-sided heat exchangers here, and these two can actually be in one huge insulated cold box, even though they are quite far away from each other in this, in this slide, in reality, they, they might be one huge block. What we're doing here, as I already suggested, is that we are using our products. So here we have the nitrogen product and here we have the oxygen product. We're using these two streams, which are really cold at this point to basically get this air feed to the temperatures that are necessary in order to do any sort of separation, cryogenic separation. The third step, which is this main column, as you can see in the model, we have it separated so it's lower column and upper column uh, or it could be upper and lower section this is where the most most separation is done where we are getting the pure nitrogen and pure oxygen as you can see here at the top we're getting the nitrogen 
product. And here coming from the bottom of the upper section, we have the oxygen. Last but not least, we have this argon side stripper. Uh, this is where we are, are getting the argon product. A few things I would like to point out here. First of all, you might notice the number of stages we have here. And actually for this model, we'll be using theoretical trace. It's very often used even in literature when it comes to air separation. For this main part, you, you very often might have well over 100 theoretical trays with the upper sections having around double the, the theoretical trays of the lower column. For the, the argon column, it, here we have around 50 theoretical trays. If higher purity is desired or yeah, desirable, we can have much more than that. And as I've already mentioned, we even might have two columns here to, to make sure that, that we are getting reasonable recovery and purity of argon. All right, so this was the, the layout. Also, one last thing I wanted to mention, uh, we'll discuss this way more in Promax, is what's going on here uh, with this reboiler of the upper section and condenser of the lower section. As you can see, these two are to get, uh, connected together with a common energy stream. And even though we, we have these two modeled you know, as a reboiler and as a condenser, in most of the cases, what's going on is that you have in the sum of the upper section, you have a vaporizer. And through this vaporizer, you are passing this, this anti-reflux agent which is being condensed. And at the same time, you are vaporizing the liquid that is at the bottom of this column. So these two, when I said that they are not exchanging uh, material directly, they are exchanging energy through this vaporizer. So it's time to move on to Promax. So the, the last two parts, which is setting up the simulation and the tools we have in Promax is something I will discuss while demonstrating it on a Promax simulation. So I'm going to switch to the model you already saw. But as you can see, this one's not as you know, nice and green as the previous one. This is not solved yet. We have one very interesting question. Uh, have you done any validation of this unit with plan data to obtain any correction factors? For instance, correction on, on binary coefficients, transport properties, and HTC factors. I personally haven't worked on a real unit, but I know that there were some cases in the past uh, done by my colleagues in the US. Uh, and as far as I know, we, we, were, we are aware that some of the, the transport properties were slightly off in, in Promax. So uh, this can be tuned and maybe validated in the future. In terms of uh, obtainable purity and separation performance, we saw a way better match. So uh, all in all, uh, the say the amount of work we do on real plants in this area is somewhat limited. And that is partly the reason why we're doing this webinar to basically open some more opportunities to validate and tune our models uh, and, and see what we can do together with our customers. We have a question about equipment sizing. Uh, so when it comes to any sort of rating and sizing of equipment, we are of course able to use the, the tools or features we have in Promax. But in, in this case, uh, as, as Daniel kind of suggested, uh, you have to make sure that all the properties of the streams are correct in order to be able to use these, uh, these features effectively to basically get trustworthy results. So it's something that, that can be used, but 
uh, you, you have to make sure that the properties that are being used for the equipment rating and sizing are correct. So, so it's something that, that we would need to further validate. Uh, one important thing maybe in, in to, to mention is that when it comes to heat exchangers, these multi-sided heat exchangers, it is quite rare to, to kind of design them yourself. Um, I, I, I am aware that there are companies that, especially for these cryogenic applications, have a lot of know-how and that they might not even give you the actual geometry of the heat exchanger. So even if you wanted to put in Promax and rate the heat exchanger, maybe uh, do it, do the calculation predictive, more often than, than not, it might not be possible because you simply don't know what exactly is inside of the heat exchanger. But there are some workarounds and, and uh, things how we can still make the model predictive. And we're actually going to discuss this uh, during, during the demonstration. So uh, just, just wait for it a bit. We have a question here whether the, the oxygen rich product from the, the lower section of the column is, is vented. As you can see here in the model, it's actually being subcooled through this heat exchanger, and then we send it to the upper column. So we, we are using it further in the process. We are basically doing some, some concentration of oxygen in this first step, and then we are using this in, in further in the process. All right, if, if we don't have any more questions, we can uh, start with setting up the simulation. So in the first step, we are going to take a look at how the environment is set up. And this has already been done for us. Uh, so we're just going to double check that we have an appropriate thermodynamic property package selected and that we have all the components we need in the environment. As you can see, we're using SRK, so a standard cubic equation of state. Of, in, in this case, Peng Robinson would work just as well. We also have some other property packages that, that could theoretically be used for, for air separation. Uh, but in terms of balance between accuracy and uh, the, the calculation time, these two are the ones I would recommend. If we take a look at components, we have just nitrogen, oxygen, and argon here. So we assume that water and CO2 was removed before we, we, it entered this process and we are neglecting the remaining components. So it's just these three, three, this, th these uh, three components, and we can start with our inlet. So I'm going to open this air feed before the compression. And we're going to say that this is air at around ambient temperature. In the Czech Republic, this summer is quite cold. So I think 21 degrees Celsius is quite accurate. Pressure is atmospheric, so zero bar gauge. And Standard vapor volumetric flow I will put in here is 35,400. This corresponds to around 1,000 tons per day. We're going to specify the composition. So we have, again, around 78% of nitrogen, around 21% of oxygen, and around 1% of argon. The feed is green, so we are ready to move on to the compression. As you can see, we have three steps here. We compress, then cool it down, compress, cool it down. Every time when you have a block with an energy stream attached to it, it gives you one extra degree of freedom. So if you compare it to, for instance, this JT valve here, where we have its isenthalpic, we don't have any energy stream here. 
Here we will be making just one specification. So basically how low we are dropping the pressure. For compressors and heat exchangers with an energy stream attached to it, we can expect that two specifications are required. What we are going to use for the compressor is is isentropic efficiency, let's assume 75%. And we will be using compression ratio for all three stages of 2.24. This should bring us to the target pressure of around 10 bar. As I said, two specification, theoretically, the efficiency can, can come from somewhere else. So you have an option to add performance curves in Promax but in this case, we are going to make an, uh, some, some guesstimate and put the efficiency here directly. All right, we can solve this block and move on to the heat exchanger. For this heat exchanger, we are going to assume some small, relatively small pressure drop, uh, say 0.15 bar. And we are going to specify that the outlet temperature is 35 degrees Celsius. Even though we have this, this heat exchanger here as a, a thin fan heat exchanger, very often uh, what, what you can see in these units is direct contact cooler where air comes into contact with, with water. This is, is advantageous for multiple reasons. One of them is that you are able to get to lower temperatures. And also, if you have some impurities that are soluble in water, you are able to remove them from air. Of course, if you have this direct contact cooler, you definitely are going to end up with saturated air. And that means that you have to make sure that you would remove water downstream of this, this cooling part. All right, now, now it's going to be a lot of repetition. So I'm just going to put in pretty much the same values for all these three stages. One trick you might not know is that if you are in a project viewer right now, I'm um, in stream number three, you can use these two arrows to move either upstream or downstream of this, of this specific stream or block. So if I wanna move downstream, I can click on this down arrow and it will bring me to the second compressor where I can go to process data, and just like before, I can set up the same efficiency and the same compression ratio. And I can go further downstream, move to the heat exchanger, specify the same pressure drop as before. And in the outlet stream, I'm going to specify that we are cooling this stream down to 35 degrees Celsius. And in the third stage, the same thing, 75%, and 2.24 and off we go. So what I can do now is to execute all these blocks. If you are, if you are um, well familiar with Promax, you probably already know that this brown color means that these streams are ready to solve. Red streams, on the other hand, are still missing some specifications. So that's what we will take care of in the further steps. But what I can do now is to simply draw a box around all, all these blocks, click on Promax, and I can execute block, or in this case, uh, a set of blocks. All right, let's take a look at this, this heat exchanger. So what we are doing here is heating up the, the oxygen outlet and nitrogen outlet while cooling down air to dew point and portion of it is going to be further cooled to bubble point. At this point, we don't really know what are the temperatures, etc., of the nitrogen and oxygen streams are. So we will have to fully specify these streams in order to be able to solve these columns. 
of course, if you if you need it or want it to to uh, calculate these, you you always can use you know recycles or some other features we have in Promax. But in this case, since we know where we want to bring this stream and this stream, it's going to help us to solve this part of heat exchanger, even though we don't know yet what's going on on the second side uh, or or in these two side these two sides. I'm going to start with pressure drop specification. For the coolers, these were single-sided heat exchangers. Here we have multi-sided heat exchangers and we have four sides, which means that we have to specify four pressure drops. For these heat exchangers, since you have typically a lot of parallel layers through which the, the stream is passing, the pressure drop is typically quite low. I'm going to Again, guess them at something really low, uh, say 1.5 kilopascals. And I'm going to use this value for three sides. For side D, I'm going to use a zero, and I will explain you why in a bit. So side D is this part. So as you can see, we are sending the full nitrogen stream through this heat exchanger. But for the oxygen, we are basically taking only part of it to balance the, the heat exchanger. So in order to, to have you know, supply equals demand, Promax is going to figure out how much we need to take in the splitter uh, to, to have this heat exchanger in balance. And just to simplify it a bit to make sure that the splitter and this mixer is operated at the same pressure, we are going to put in the pressure drop of zero for the size D. So this was just a quick explanation. And let me move on to stream number eight. As you can see from the name, this is dew point air, which is why I need to open this stream and specify that we have 100% of vapor here. And you can see we're at minus 165 degrees Celsius. So since we are at elevated pressure, the temperature is, is going to be slightly higher than what we saw for the normal boiling points, but still it's really, really cold. This, this splitter here, where we are sending part of the the air to back to the heat exchanger to get it to bubble point send it through this turbine and then to the upper column is something that can be optimized and as i said there are a lot of different configurations this expander might not be present at all instead there might be some internal compression around the heat exchanger and, and for this configuration you you would typically see around one third of the feed being sent to uh, to the turbine. So we had a little over 30,000 cubic meters per hour in the feed. So let's say that 10,000 is being sent to the expander. This is bubble point air. So just like for the dew point, we're going to specify fraction vapor. In this case, bubble point or saturated liquid corresponds to 0% vapor. We'll leave the expander as it is for now because we don't really need it for solving this lower column. As I said, this is the part where you are getting enriched oxygen stream and you are getting high purity nitrogen, which is then, it, it can be a product, but in this case, we, we are not taking part of it as a product. We are sending all of it to the upper section. For this lower column, as you could see in the, the example layout, you might see something around 35 theoretical trace. So I'm going to open the lower column and specify number of stages to 35. 
If I switch to process data, you will see we're using the concept of theoretical trace. So the ideal stage model type is the correct one, the one that, that we want to use. Let's also specify pressure drop here. So if I switch to stages, I'm going to specify that the bottom of the column is operated at 6.2 bar, and I'm going to specify pressure drop of 0.3. If I do this, you will see that the top, st the top stage pressure is determined from these two pieces of information and the pressure profile is expected to be linear. If I do something like this, so if I have around 10 bar here and I specify in the column that it is actually operated at lower pressure, what Promax is assuming is that there's a JT valve upstream of the column through which we're basically throttling the stream to this target pressure of 6.2 bar. All right, if I switch to specification, you will see we have one degree of freedom available. This is because of the energy stream, which is common for these two blocks. So this is basically our vaporizer. So I'm going to say that the reflux ratio uh, is 1.5 and we, we can and will change this specification later in the process, but reflux ratio is something we call a, a natural uh, variable or specification for a column. So it's going to be easier for the column to converge at this point. I put in this specification, I activated it by switching to this radio button specification. You can see I already have only or I already have a, a fully, fully defined problem in terms of degrees of freedom. However, if I minimize the project viewer, you will see that there are still some red streams around here. Uh, the reason is that first of all, in this condenser, we don't have pressure drop specified. So I'm going to assume zero because otherwise if there was any pressure drop, this stream would be at lower pressure than the top stage pressure, which would make Promax issue a warning to us. And it's still red. Uh, the reason is that we, we didn't tell Promax if this is a total condenser, it might be even subcooling uh, this liquid. So I need to tell Promax that this is uh, zero percent vapor. So this is at its bubble point, no subcooling present. And if I did everything correctly, I should be able to execute the block now. And as, as you could see, it worked like a charm. It's just three components, uh, one column, really simple to converge. If we do this, we can take a look at the, the composition of these intermediate products. So if I open this, this oxygen stream, you can see we have around 37% of oxygen. Uh, so it is somewhere in the range I mentioned before, somewhere between 35 and 40. For this N2 reflux agent, if we go to composition and take a look, this is really high purity nitrogen. So something that, that could be used as a product if, if we only targeted on, on nitrogen, we still wouldn't be happy. And I'm going to show you why. If I open this lower column, go to process data and switch to recoveries, you will see that even though we have really high purity product or intermediate product, in terms of recoveries, 45% of nitrogen is still leaving in the, the oxygen enriched stream. So let's use the other part of the column to get some, some nicer product with high purities. As I said, this lower column is operated at high pressure. We saw it was around six bar. This upper section, on the other hand, is going to be operated around 1.5 bar. This not only is helping, but it's, it's, it's absolutely necessary because this whole idea of the, the vaporizer, where we are condensing 
nitrogen while vaporizing uh, the, the oxygen liquid here at the bottom wouldn't work if it was operated at the same pressure. Because nitrogen, it has, it has lower boiling point than oxygen. It couldn't work. So there's the reason why we need different pressures in the two columns. All right, as I said, the, the upper section is going to be operated 1.5 bar. So for this, for this stream, basically how much we are, or, or what pressure we are flashing this stream to, we can, we can specify 1.6 bar. So slightly above the pressure in the column. And now we're getting to another heat exchanger here, another multi-sided heat exchanger. So before we specify anything else, I'm just going to put in the pressure drops real quick. Since this is even smaller heat exchanger, let's assume that the pressure drop is even lower, below one kilopascal. For this condenser, you can see the default value, which is already here for me, was zero. And the reason is the same as for the condenser in the lower section. It's because we want to make sure uh, that this is not below the top stage pressure. All right, so the pressures are in. And now we, again, got to find out a way how to specify these streams uh, even though we don't know what's going on in part of the heat exchanger yet, because we don't don't have any information about this this stream number twenty two about the nitrogen stream, we also do not know what's going on in this argon side stripper. And for now, I'm just going to put in some numbers I know are going to work. But in the last part, I'm going to show you how you actually can. Uh, make this heat exchanger work predictively. And when something changes in terms of the other side of the heat exchanger, it can be accounted for. So for now, I'm just going to say that this, this stream, which is, you can see just 16% of vapor at this point is going to be vaporized to 73% of vapor. So this demands heat. This, on the other hand, is going to be subcooled. So this supplies heat. This is going to be heated up. So this demands heat. This is the nitrogen, which is really cold. And here, the temperature is going to be higher. And this is condensing. So it, of course, supplies heat. So we have basically supply, demand, supply, demand, uh, two sides, two hot sides, and two cold sides in this heat exchanger. This one stream is green. We're happy about that. Now we also have to specify this stream number 15 somehow. We definitely know the pressure of this one. It needs to be at 1.6 bar, more or less. But that's not enough. We could theoretically specify to what temperature we're subcooling this. What we can do instead is to, again, specify fraction vapor in this stream. And it's going to be less than, than before because we want to have most of this in liquid phase because this is the main reflux of the column. So I'm going to specify 7.5%. Once I do this, you, you will notice that this is brown. This is no longer red. So what Promax is going to do, it's basically going to calculate how much I need to subcool this liquid in order to get 7.5% of vapor downstream of this JT valve. So this is an example of kind of back propagation of parameters through the simulation. All right, so these two streams are green. This one's still red. We know that this is going to be just like all the other streams at 1.6 bar. But this is not really enough information. 
because we also have to tell something about the efficiency of this expander. This is liquid phase, partly flashing uh, to, to vapor. So we can expect the efficiency to be, to be rather high. This expander, since the flash is going to be close to isentropic, in most of the cases, when you are looking at, at say, vapor expander, isentropic expansion can lead to lower temperatures. So it might help get us colder. In this case, and I'm not going to demonstrate it, but you would see if you put a JT valve here instead, you would see that there is not too much change in terms of temperature. But since we're flashing to two phase region, it's going to affect how much vapor we'll have in this stream. So with isentropic uh, expansion, we're actually going to end up with less vapor, which in this case is desirable because we have uh, because we have more reflux in the column. At the same time, we are able to get a bit of shaft, shaft work out of this expander, 20 kilowatts. Is this, is this a lot? Well, if you take a look at the shaft work for the compressors, for each stage, it's around 1,000 kilowatts. So it's not really a huge contribution, but you know this, this can, as I said, uh, allow you to, to have less vapor in the stream. If you had a JT valve here, it wouldn't make much of a difference, uh, but basically two con all, uh, both configurations are possible. All right, here we have the upper column. As you can see, this is going to be a bit more complicated than the, the previous column. And there are multiple reasons. One of them is, this, is that this argon side stripper is going to be calculated together with the column. So we are actually going to assign this upper column as a main column for our argon side stripper. They are going to do the calculation simultaneously. We also have a lot of feeds here. We have this, this main reflux stream, uh, which is the, the high purity nitrogen. And then we have another two feeds, which we will connect to the, the column in a bit. And we will also discuss what would be an appropriate position of these, uh, these connections. Let's, let's get started. First of all, I'm going to change the number of stages. As I said, this upper, upper column may often have something like a double the number, the, the double, not double the number of the stages of the lower section. So I'm going to open this column and I'm going to specify that this is 70 stages. I'm going to go to process data and I'm going to go to stages to specify pressure drop. Here I'm going to show you another option or another way how to set up a pressure drop in a column. So in the first column, what we used was pressure change together with the, the pressure at the bottom. Here, what I'm going to use instead is specification of top and bottom stage pressures. If I do this, you will see the pressure change is calculated again. The pressure profile is assumed to be linear. If I go to specifications now, there's zero specifications available. The reason is that we do have one energy stream attached to the column, but it's already solved based on what comes from this calculation. However, if we take a look at these two columns together, there's definitely going to be some degrees of freedom. One of them is the condenser duty here. Another is how much argon we're taking from this upper column to this argon side stripper. So basically the draw ratio uh, all in this upper column. So we, are, we, we should see two degrees of freedom and we will in a moment. 
what I'm going to do right now is that I'm going to connect all these streams together. You can see right now I don't have any connection points available uh, to, to make them available to me. I need to go to process data and I need to go to stages. And here you can see we have a column show stage where we can activate the connection points. First connection point I'm going to activate is stage number 35, which is around the middle. Around the middle, what, what you will see in terms of composition through the column is so-called argon belly. So that's the point, since argon has a boiling point between nitrogen and oxygen, it will get concentrated around the middle of the column. And this is the point where we want to take this, this argon vapor and we want to process it further in this argon side stripper. So we are going to have a draw here, stream number 29. And the liquid from this side stripper will be sent back to this very stage. So this was one connection point. We also need two more connection points for, for stream 18 and 21. This stream is 37% oxygen. This is the oxygen enriched stream. This is still the composition of air. So this is 21% of oxygen. You don't want to have too much oxygen too close to the top of the column uh, because then it might, it might ruin the purity of your nitrogen product. You also don't want to have it too close to the argon belly. Uh, so typically it might be around one third of uh, this column from the top. I've already done some testing in this model, so I know that stages 19 and 23 work fine, but this is something you can investigate with Promax to basically see how the unit behaves if you connect it somewhere else. My question right now is going to be where should I connect these two streams? And before you start answering, I'm, uh, I'm going to show you something that might help you up. I'm going to show you temperature of these streams and the amount, the amount of oxygen we have in them. I use the callout for this, which is basically a way to report properties of a given process stream. And I'm going to connect it to uh, the three streams we have here. Let me re rearrange this a bit. So this, this stage or th this stream, it's clear, it's going to be at the top. But when it comes to stream 18 and 21, what do you think? Should I connect stream number 18 or stream number 21 closer to the top? So should I connect stream number 18 or stream number 21 to this connection point number 19. This is actually a bit of a tricky question. The way I have it right now kind of suggests or incepts the idea to your minds that it should be stream number 18. But in terms of composition and also temperature gradient in the column, we are coldest at the top and warmest at the bottom. We have pure nitrogen at the top and pure oxygen at the bottom. And we want the connection points to correspond to, to these trends. So that's the reason why we are going to connect stream number 21 to, to this connection point, uh, because there's less oxygen and it's colder. And we're going to connect stream number 18 to the connection point at stage 23. We, we have quite a bit of information inside of Promax around this column. We haven't specified anything about this argon side stripper yet. So I'm going to open it and I'm going to specify the number of stages to be 50. If I go to process data, again, we're using the ideal stage model type and let's also specify the pressure profile. If I specify just pressure change, so if I, for instance, say it's 0.1 bar, 
Promax is automatically going to populate the pressure stages based on the lowest pressure out of all the feet, which is, which is actually advantageous in this case, because if I, for instance, change pressure in this main column, the pressure profile in this argon side stripper is going to be automatically adjusted uh, because there will be different pressure coming in this stream number 29. Okay, so this was the pressure profile. And as I said, what we actually want to do is to connect the calculations of these two columns. We want to assign this upper column to be main column for or the governing column for this argon side stripper. How to do that? Well, if you go to column under properties here, one of the drop downs is main column. And here I can select upper column, uh, which as you could see, made some difference, definitely. If I go back to the upper column and switch to specifications, first of all, I have achieved what I wanted. So I have two degrees of freedom as I would anticipate. And I also can control specifications of both columns from this major one, from this governing one. The two specifications I will be using for the upper column, I'm going to specify purity of oxygen. I'm actually going to do it inversely. So I'm going to specify argon and oxygen. For purities of all sorts, the, the appropriate specification is component flow slash composition. Let's confirm this, select stream, which is bottoms liquid. This is the oxygen product leaving the, the say vaporizer or reboiler, leaving the bottom of the column. And we will select argon. The basis is small fraction and I'm going to specify 0.4% of, of argon. So we are going to have 99.6% of oxygen, or we would expect around something like that. And I'm going to select this as specification. So it should consume one degree of freedom, which it has. So I can do a second specification and this one will be related to my side stripper because it's going to control the condenser. And I'm going to specify that my argon purity is 97%. This is distillate vapor, mole fraction of argon and 97%. As I mentioned, it can be even more, uh, but it would require more theoretical trace or even a second column. In this case, 97% is what we target for. All right, looks like there's no red stream around my column. So we can try to execute the block and see what happens. There's one thing I, I now realized I forgot during setting up the model. I mentioned that this draw stream is vapor draw. However, in Promax, the default setting for any sort of draw is expecting liquid to be drawn. So if I go to my column and go to connections, you will see this, that stream number 29 is light liquid outlet. If you want to change this, what you need to do is to right click on, on stage number 35 and go to outlet phase. And if I click on move light liquid to vapor, it's going to change the, the draw stream to be vapor outlet. And this I believe is what I did wrong and what prevented the column from solving. On the example of this complex column, there's one thing I, I wanted to demonstrate to you. There, for these complex problems, it might be a good idea to change some convergence settings we have for columns. 
it might eventually get to a solution even with the default settings but the first iteration was approximate and it takes quite a while to to get to the second iteration so i don't like to wait for too long what i can do is abort the calculation and if i go to the column and switch to convergence you will see that there are some settings available to you the first i would recommend to change if you see a situation like this is the enthalpy model we have two options here either boston breadth or composition dependent and the difference between the two if i right click on this enthalpy model and click on what's this which is a very useful feature you will see that as the inner loop is solving and the flows and compositions of the liquid and vapor phases are changing the boston breed model will not show any change to the enthalpy the composition dependent model as the name suggests is going to account for the changes between the inner loop iterations so it's it's basically going to be a bit more computationally intensive but at the same time in most of the cases it's more robust and it's more likely to get to the solution and very often even faster so let's see what happens if i switch this enthalpy model to composition dependent that was better so you can see really easy if 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 you also don't like to wait for too long you can always try the composition dependent model and it should fix a lot of problems sometimes if a column doesn't converging it might be because it's simply not thermodynamically feasible so i would also recommend to always check whether all the inputs are correct for instance you could see that uh when i had the wrong phase for the draw stream it, it definitely was not going to work if you are sure that everything's correct you can go ahead and try the different enthalpy model to get it to converge all right so we we already have this main part converge we already see the purities so we have 99.1 percent nitrogen purity we have 99.6 percent oxygen purity 97 percent argon if we take a look at recovery so if i open this this column and go to process data and recoveries you will see that we are recovering almost 100 percent of nitrogen 97.7 percent of oxygen quite good for argon it's around 60 percent so even though we have relatively high purity product we are not recovering as much as we could with with some of the different configurations that are used nowadays maybe just one thing that is also great to look at for the results is the argon belly I mentioned before so if I switch to components uh, you will see this is vapor phase we are seeing and basically concentration along the column and you will see that argon is really getting concentrated towards the middle of the column where we'll, we're taking the draw and and then sending it back to the column after we do some further refining of the argon product you also can see the the expected trend for the other column for the other components so nitrogen is getting close to 100 percent towards the the top if we send one of these feeds where we have quite a bit of oxygen in this you know final polishing area you you would probably see lower purity of nitrogen all right so these were the results and now we will be discussing the last part which is the the advanced tools we have in promax and how you can actually use them for heat exchanger performance in this specific case so we can see right now this one's still red and we we, we probably need to somehow specify uh the the temperature or something else that will determine the heat duty of this multi-sided heat exchanger i already mentioned that it's it even though promax has the capability to rate a multi-sided heat exchanger it is not very common to actually know the actual geometry to know the the configuration in terms of how the layers are set up 
in the column, which medium is actually getting in contact with which, etc. So we, we typically need to find some workaround to predict the performance of the heat exchanger. One way to do that, and something we will be using for this last demonstration, is assume that this type of heat exchanger is able to get you to really low temperature approach. Say somewhere between one and two degrees Celsius uh, is typically a safe estimate. Another thing you might use is, is basically using an iterative calculator we have in Promax to target some UA. So basically uh, multiplication between the overall heat transfer coefficient and the RIA, which is, can be assumed to some extent to be constant uh, when the performance is changing. So there are some ways to still make the heat exchanger calculation predictive even though you might not know the geometry of the heat exchanger. As I said, we are going to use the temperature approach in this case. And for this specific multi-sided heat exchanger, we do know that the pinch is, is actually at one or the other end of the heat exchanger. So uh, we have endpoint pinch in this case. And I also do know that this pinch is on the, the hot end of the heat exchanger. So I can expect this stream number number 34 and this, this, this nitrogen outlet to be able to get as close as 100 cent degree to my air feet. And I could, of course, since I know that this is 35 degrees Celsius, I could, of course, directly specify that this is 34 and this is 34. Or I can use one of the advanced tools that we have in Promax, and this one's called a specifier. If you are not familiar with this concept, it is basically a calculator which allows you to set one parameter as a function of one or more other process variables. And in this case, it's going to be really simple. We're just going to create a specifier on the temperature of this and this stream. We will use this temperature as a reference and we will do a simple mathematical uh, operation, basically extracting one degree Celsius uh, to get a result. So if I open this stream number 34 to start with and I right click on the parameter that I wanna control, which is the temperature of this stream, you will see that I'm able to create a simple specifier here. Here we have two boxes. Here I will put an equation which will get me to 34 degrees Celsius. So it's going to be the temperature of uh, the air feed, stream number seven, minus one degree Celsius. If I put T7 minus one here, Nothing is happening yet. The reason is that Promax doesn't know what T7 means, which is what the second box is here for to declare the variable to explain Promax what T7 means. So I'm going to click on add and I'm going to navigate to the temperature stream number seven through this moniker tree. Moniker is basically an identifier of any given parameter in Promax. So stream number seven it is and let's find its temperature and let's name it the same way I did in the equation. And once I do this, you can see it basically loaded the value 35 degrees Celsius minus one is 34. Now I'm going to do the same thing for the, the nitrogen outlet stream. The moniker tree is going to bring me where I left off. So I can simply select the temperature of stream seven again, and I can put in the same equation. And once I do this, I can execute flow sheet and the heat exchanger is now ready to solve because here we actually know the, how much, how much heat we, we are, we need in you know, order to get to this higher temperature to 34 degrees Celsius. And here, as I said, Promax is figuring out how much we need to send through this splitter in order to, do, to have this heat exchanger in balance. 
the advantage of, of this approach is if I now decide to change this, this temperature in stream number seven, these two temperatures are always going to adjust automatically. So that's the way to, you know, as long as there's uh, an endpoint pinch on the, the hot end, it will be always ensured that, that it, it, the approach is one degree Celsius. And just to demonstrate that we really have the pinch at the hot end, here it is. If I go to process data and heat transfer, you will see that the minimum end approach temperature is equal to minimum effective approach temperature and that they are both one centigrade. All right, so this was one of the heat exchangers. Now let's take a look at the second one. So the subcooler. If I open it and go to plots, go to heat transfer, you will see that in this case, the pinch is actually not at at uh, one or the other end of the heat exchanger. It is here in the middle. We have internal pinch here. We can find out what exactly the pinch is. If I go to process data and heat transfer, you will see it's again around one degree Celsius. So uh, it is actually similar to the previous case, but at a different position in the heat exchanger. In this case, it gets trickier to, to make sure that this will always be one centigrade. And the way you can do it is to use the different kind of calculator we have in Promax, which is a solver, uh, an iterative calculator. And I'm going to show you why it's important or why, why it can be beneficial to use this, this calculator. So, if I, for instance, decide to investigate what is happening if I decrease the amount of vapor in stream number 15, so if I decide to have even more liquid being sent as reflux to the upper column, I can go to stream number 15, specify 5%, for instance, and I can execute flow sheet. If I do this, well, what happened? The nitrogen purity has increased, which looks awesome. But at the same time, if I open the heat exchanger and take a look at the eff effective approach temperature, it has dropped to 0.6 degrees Celsius, which I might assume to be infeasible. And, and I would really like to somehow balance the heat exchanger to get back to one uh, percent one, one degree Celsius approach. So the way it works, since this is being cooled down, this is being vaporized. I can assume that less vapor here means more vapor here. I have, however, directly specified the vapor fraction here. Instead, what I could do is to create this iterative calculator here on this small fraction vapor to target the approach to be one centigrade. To do that, since this is, as I said, the adjusted or controlled parameter by the, the calculator, by what we call a simple solver, I will right click on this small fraction vapor and I will click on create simple solver. And now, you can see something similar to what we saw in a specifier. We again have two boxes. In this case, we don't have any mathematical expression which will, would relate the approach to the mole fraction vapor. Uh, so instead, we are going to put in some sort of objective function. And the way it works is that whatever you put in here will be driven to zero. So your goal is to put in something here that uh, when it's zero, you found a solution. For instance, if you put it here, approach minus one. Well, if this is zero, then approach is one degree Celsius. So that's our goal. This function should work just fine. I again need to declare the variable. So I need to go to uh blocks and to be honest with you i'm not sure which heat exchanger it is it's okay 102 
So again, blocks, heat exchanger, what 102. Q manager properties, and here I can find minimum effective approach temperature. Just one small adjustment. This is just loosening the tolerance because the default tolerance is 1,000th and we don't really need to be as accurate as you know 0.001 uh, centigree. So I have loosened it a bit. And if I execute the flow sheet now, Promax is going to iterate on this fraction vapor to balance my previous adjustment. And if everything works all right, I'm expecting the effective approach to be my target. So one degree Celsius. It is at least within the tolerance, what I expected. You also can see that the nitrogen uh, purity has dropped back to where it previously was or really close to where it previously was. So if we have the same amount of heat integration uh, and these two are balanced, if we vaporize less here and more here, it's not going to affect the overall performance too much. The first question I, I, uh, we have here from previously is, uh, are we connected stream 21 because of uh, nitrogen purity or colder temperature? I would say colder temperature is the, the more important effect. Generally, you kind of want to, to moderate the temperature profile and the concentration profile through the column the way we're doing here. So it is helping us to get colder in this, this uh, top third section at the same time. It helps us to, to have you know, this, this uh, gradual gradient between nitrogen and oxygen in the column. How much total power? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. So if we take a look at these three compressors, which are the main contributors, uh, we have basically around 1.2 megawatts per each stage. So it's going to be something like 3.6, 3.7-ish megawatts uh, for this, this 1,000 tons per day unit. And this brings us to the, another question, which is how to know specific energy consumption related to the O2 production, the oxygen production. I'm not going to demonstrate it now, but in Promax, you are able to, to create a user value uh, in, this, in these user value sets. If I click on add, uh, you can see I can create an artificial variable. And what I could do here, is basically create a new variable, which will be in say megawatts per ton. And I can associate it with a new specifier. This is specific energy. And within this specifier, I would be able to declare all three, all three work or energy contributors from the three stages, or maybe some, some auxiliary equipment I might also have in the process. And I could put here the production of oxygen and basically by dividing uh, these two, I could find out what is the specific energy uh, of the process. If we go to air feet, uh, you will see we have, we have, if we do it in tons per day, we have a little over a thousand tons per day in this specific unit. A very good question. Uh, can you briefly describe how to use Promax to optimize the, the process parameters? The, one of the tools I haven't demonstrated in, in uh, this, this webinar is scenario tool that allows you to run uh, parametric studies uh, and you are basically able to investigate how, how different parameters, pressures, flow rates, even uh, even you could even play with the feet uh, position uh, with some workaround. You could basically investigate how the system behaves and how you're able to get you know higher priorities, better recoveries. One thing we don't have yet in version 5.0, but we ex 
expect this to be to be uh, released with a new version is so-called optimization tool. And this allows you to do multivariable uh, optimization, which is probably a perfect feature for this sort of complex systems where you know you you want to take a look at it um, from the, the kind of bigger picture and, and make sure that that all the, the parameters that you can tune are tuned in order to get the highest possible um, you know yield and and uh, also optimize energy etc so I think the optimization tool is something that will be very helpful in the future. Right now, we also have some ways to do these multivariable optimizations. We have worked with our customers uh, on, on cases where we use VBA, for instance, or Python to, to do this complex optimization. So if, if you had a real case like this you would, and you, you would like to work on it with us, do not hesitate to contact us and, and we will figure something out. We have a question if, if we assumed any particular matter in the inlet air, we have not. In general, in Promax, we do not have solid phase. Uh, so we assume for this specific model that, that any particular matter was removed uh, through a mechanical filter upstream of the unit. Uh, there's a question if we can do membrane simulation in Promax. And yes, we absolutely can. We have a membrane block in Promax. What we would need is, is some permeability data for uh, this specific process. But if we have it, uh, there's nothing easier than put in Promax. As I mentioned before, we are actually planning a webinar on membranes. Uh, it might very likely happen in August. Uh, so uh, if, if you are interested more in the topics of membranes, uh, feel free to sign up. We'll be happy to see you there. Uh, Daniel is asking about the feet air pressure uh, and how it affects separation and what is typical range. From what I've seen, it typically ranges somewhere between 6 and 10 uh, bar. So here we are um, closer to the, to the, you know, upper bound of, of this range. And when you're asking how it affects separation, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not sure, but there's, uh, that's why we have Promax and how we can investigate what would happen. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for attending. If you are interested in, in working with us on any sort of air separation technology, do not hesitate to reach out to us. You can either contact me directly or you can always contact our general support email, support at bre.com. I really appreciate you joining me today. I wish you a beautiful afternoon. Thank you, guys.